I'm Brahmin Maisman. I am an instructor at SLIS, uh, School of Library Information Studies. Uh, I teach uh, in the um, MA program in Library Information Studies, and I teach um, in the areas of information organization, collection management, um, metadata, and digital humanities. So um, the examples I'm gonna be talking about today are based on my teaching in metadata and digital humanities. Um, and I'm really lucky to work with a lot of really engaged graduate students um, who are also really interested in learning about new tools for their own professional interests. So I think that um, gives my teaching with technology a little bit of extra um, pizzazz <laughs> because I have students to bounce ideas off of. And I wanna thank three students um, before I get started who um, contributed to this presentation, Kelsey Sorensen, Allison Langham, um, are both MA students who um, kindly gave some feedback on the on the use of one of these tools, and also Caitlin Schwabeck in the SLIS library also helped me with the design of the presentation. So um, <coughs> I'll, I guess I'll just get started with um, what I wanted. So um, what I generally always want is a way for students to have fun and get engaged with content um, and learn course content and also learn about new technology. Um, so specifically, for the online course that I was teaching, um, which is about metadata standards and applications, which is basically how to ca catalog everything that isn't books or archival materials, um, I wanted a way for my online students to engage with themes of um, historical development of metadata and context for metadata standards without having to just sit in front of their um, computers and watch me give a 25 minute lecture on the history of metadata standards, which is a pretty dry topic. Um, and I also wanted them to have a way to um, share content with each other. Um, one of the challenges in online teaching is um, kind of diversifying the channels of communication. So I wanted them to be able to communicate with each other in addition to the communication between me and them. Uh, so, and the, the next thing I wanted um, was for my on-campus class in digital humanities, I wanted a way for students um, to be able to create online maps and exhibits uh, using a tool that was, um, had a really, um, had a really easy learning curve because that class um, is sort of overstuffed with content and I didn't want to spend that much time teaching the tool. Uh, I wanted students to engage with an existing online digital humanities project and then ex um, visualize it uh, to explore what makes an effective visualization, what um, makes an ineffective visualization, and also just to become more familiar with the content of that project. So <coughs> I, for both of these problems, I used um, tools from the same, uh, I guess, development team at Northwestern University, which is the Knight Lab, um, and they um, develop open source tools for data visualization for journalism and for the humanities. Um, so the first one of these tools that I used was Timeline.js. I used Timeline.js for my online, uh, online metadata class. Um, and I, the idea that I had was I wanted the students to create a collaborative timeline about the history of metadata standards. Um, and in terms of tools that I tried before using Timeline.js, uh, I experimented with another tool called TikiTalki, which is T-I-K-I-T-O-K-I, um, um, which is also a really useful tool for creating um, interactive, media-rich timelines. Uh, it does have limitations, though. Um, students have to sign up for an account to use the tool, and I always try and avoid um, getting students to have to give their email address and information to um, websites if they don't have to. Um, and then also the TikiTalki, the free version of TikiTalki only allows a student to create one timeline. So it would basically be teaching them a tool which they could use once. Um, or if they wanted to experiment with something, they'd have to erase their existing timeline. Uh, but TikiTalki is useful and if you're interested in this um, kind of activity, it's something that you could also look at. Um, I think that was the only other tool that I looked at seriously. There's a couple of apps um, like that you have to download to your workstation that I looked at, um, but I thought also that th those would be too much trouble for students. 
Um, so this is what I ended up doing, and I'll, I'll show you how TimelineJS works. Um, um, so the way that TimelineJS works is um, you um, use a Google um, Sheets template from that's provided um, online, and um, this was actually kind of useful for the metadata class because they were creating structured data <laughs> in the spreadsheet. Um, so you give the start date and end date of each event, um, you write a headline for the event, explanatory text, and then you can provide links to media. And TimelineJS allows you to embed um, a really large variety of media. Um, this particular timeline contains only photos, but you can also embed videos and sound clips from SoundCloud. Um, so that's basically all they had to do. I set up this, this template. I filled it with a few events, and then <coughs> I shared the spreadsheet with the class and asked them to go ahead and add events um, to the spreadsheet. And they could add events based on their assigned course readings, or they could do some exploration of specific areas that they were interested in. And one of the successes from this activity was that students chose events that I would have never thought of including in a timeline of um, this topic uh, based on their specific interests. So I had students in that class who were interested in um, moving image metadata, uh, music metadata, and they chose events um, related to those fields. So that's what the spreadsheet looks like. Um, what the timeline looks like is this. So um, there's a, you can customize this, but the default is that there's a timeline along the bottom, um, and then each event is at the top. So um, you'll have a chance to explore stuff further. But um, and then the the media, this item here is whatever you link in the media column. So you can see that you end up with something nice, really nice, um, pretty quickly. And all the formatting is done automatically by them. Yeah. Yeah, you can customize the fonts and um, some of the sizes, um, but uh, the defaults are easy and easy. So that's what worked with um, Timeline JS. In my digital humanities class this semester, um, I used a tool from the same development team called StoryMath.js. Uh, and the reason I chose this tool was actually because I had um, a student in my digital humanities class last spring who got a job um, working as a digital humanities specialist for a research library in New York City. And she um, actually created a number of different story maps for that institution based on uh, materials in their collection. So story map, you can see, looks pretty similar to Timeline JS. It's not spreadsheet based. Um, you create the story map um, right on the web, filling in, it's basically like filling in an online form. Um, and it's map based instead of being time based. So the best way to see how this works is to look at one. <laughs> um, so <coughs> this is a story map that was created by Kelsey Sorensen, who's a student in my digital humanities class right now. Um, and I asked the students to create a story map based on a specific project. So she based this on a project called Bomb Sites, um, which is an online map of all the sites of bombings in London during World War II. But she kind of wanted to extend the human story of, of um, those bombings. So you can see that it um, starts with a map and that each event needs to be linked to a location on the map. Um, and that process is also really easy to search for locations on the map and place pins. Um, and similarly to Timeline JS, you choose media that you want to feature and create headlines and captions. <laughs> so that's the bomb sites. Um, uh, the bomb sites story map. Um, another story map is um, this story map uh, by Allison Langham, who's also in my class, and she was basing it on um, an online project which. Um, tracks um, trends in execution of women in the United States since 1680. And so she wanted to focus on um, data about women executed in the US after 1978. And also as part of this assignment, I asked the, student, the students to include at least one image that was a quantitative visualization um, of data. Just there was another teaching goal there. So that's why you see the maps and charts there. 
And then this map, I actually ended up finding this quite um, powerful because it really tracks the personal stories of these women. Um, so that's what worked with those two tools. Allison Langham said that she found it fairly easy to decide on the content for her story map. She found the site easy to use, um, and but she also found Timeline JS easy to use, and she liked um, the way it works with the spreadsheets. And these are the kind of students that I work with, so I really have an easy job because she emails me and says, "And I really like spreadsheets." So, <laughs> um, and Kelsey Sorensen uh, responded and said, "It's fun being given a tool to mess with and pushing its abilities." even if I found out that it can't do what I want it to. So the, both of these tools um, seem to be successful at getting students to um, explore their data, experiment, um, and I haven't heard that much frustration um, from either of these tools. I did learn a few things um, that would influence what I would do next time with this assignment, and um, really the only technical issue that I would attack the next time I use story map um, is I would provide more guidance and structure on the media types that can be used in this tool um, because there are issues with um, basically using web pages. Um, the documentation says you can just put a link to a web page, but um, because of um, the way the tool handles third party cookies, sometimes web pages don't load. Um, so I had to provide more guidance and some email support um, on that issue. The other two things I would do differently are more pedagogical or structural. Um, I, I think that it would be more effective if I provided more guidance at the beginning of the assignment um, for students to do the intellectual work of um, laying out their data for either their story map or their timeline. So um, the nice thing about Timeline JS is that you're not really thinking about what this, the product is gonna look like. You're, because you're using the spreadsheet, you're forced to make sure that your data is complete and that everything kind of connects together intellectually before you even see the shiny product at the end. Um, whereas with Story Map, because you don't create it using a spreadsheet, I think it's um, easier for students to be unfocused in the way that they're um, compiling their data and they might not be thinking that much about whether what they're producing actually makes sense for um, the user of their Story Map. Um, and students did say that they found it helpful to do brainstorming on paper, um, to kind of talk about ideas with each other before they even got into the tool and started creating their story map. Um, and then also, um, I might ask students to adapt an existing piece of work into the story map format rather than creating a new interpretation. Um, so for example, if a student had written a research paper that they felt could be adapted into the story map format, um, I thought that that might be kind of less overwhelming than giving an open topic. Um, or I would give students more opportunity or time or structure for doing the work of interpretation that w is behind the story map. So this assignment was a weekly homework assignment. The students had two weeks to complete it. So I really didn't want it to be um, a giant part of their semester. Um, but I could see expanding this so that the um, it was a longer assignment that included more original research on the part of the students. So it's this one time assignment, or they do it this one time, right? Yeah, yeah, they are actually, it's, um, they were assigned it two weeks ago, and it's actually due on Monday. So these two students have completed them. Um, um, they sort of jumped the gun and <laughs> got their assignments done early. And then finally, I actually wanted, you to leave, I wanted to leave you with some ideas from one of the students about how the tool, the story map tool could be applied outside of um, this particular class. This is, again, Kelsey, um, who had a couple of ideas for how it could be used in a history class. And uh, my students in the digital humanities class are all very interested in um, tracking and interpreting data related to social movements on campus and around the country. Um, and I have students who are doing interpretation and data collecting related to the real, the real UW hashtag um, on campus right now. So Kelsey was thinking about some of those themes. And she was also talking about how story maps or the Timeline JS tool could be a really interesting way to get students to create um, in-class presentations, sort of a non-PowerPoint method of um, displaying and interpreting um, information. 
So that's all I wanted to talk about before the hands-on period.